Christmas on acid. Welcome to the Weird Christmas Podcast. I'm Craig Kringle. I'm just going to come right out and say what we're all thinking. Santa Claus is a big, red, hallucinogenic mushroom. And you know it too, way down deep in your psychedelic belly. Okay, now before you go delete the podcast or go listen to something more boring, let me give you some background. Ever since I started sharing these weird old postcards years ago, I've always gotten questions from people asking about the connection between Santa Claus and this little red mushroom with a white stem and white dots called Amanita muscaria, or sometimes the fly agaric mushroom. It's a theory that haunts all the shadowy corners of the internet. Now, you've probably seen this thing too, even if you don't remember. It's all over the old cards, and a lot of Christmas decorations, especially from Northern Europe and Scandinavia, they still feature mushrooms or mushroom people. I mean, I was even walking around a holiday market in Chicago the other day and saw an entire shelf full of ornaments and knickknacks shaped like the things. I'll put a bunch of examples on weirdchristmas.com for you to see. Anyway, after promising a ton of people I'd get to this, it's finally time. So in a nutshell, the story goes that in pre-Christian Northern Europe and Asia, particularly Siberia, There were ages-old shamanic traditions where tribal shaman would eat the Amanita muscaria mushrooms and use them in healing ceremonies or vision quests or what have you. Now, we're talking about very ancient traditions, so the details are always pretty murky and different. But the tradition is actually still around in some areas, and there are pictures on my website of the shaman doing their thing. But when you start to dig into all the aspects of the mushroom's biology and ecology and the rituals around it, things get interesting. This all happens way up north, relatively near the North Pole. They only grow under evergreens, like beautiful little presents. Reindeer love to eat them, and I'll scarf so many that they get so high you might say they're flying. Some of the shaman did and still do dress up like the mushroom in big red and white coats. And there's more, but hopefully you can see where this is going. Actually, Terrence McKenna does a better job of explaining it than I do. And if you don't know who McKenna was, think Timothy Leary, but much more entertaining and much, much stranger. If you go to the Encyclopedia Britannica and you look up Santa Claus, they'll tell you that it has to do with St. Nicholas and it got started in the 11th century. And it's a, But when you look at the Santa Claus story, first of all, Santa Claus's colors are red and white, the colors of the Amanita muscaria, for sure. Santa Claus lives at the North Pole. What does this mean? It means that Santa Claus lives at the Axis Mundi, where Yggdrasil, the magic world ash of Welsh mythology, has uh, taken root. Santa Claus flies. This is what shaman do. Santa Claus is the master of the reindeer, the animal most associated with the Amanita muscaria. So, so here are all the motifs, and I believe that for children in our culture, that all the Christer stuff is not what Christmas is about. Christmas is about standing in front of the tree on Christmas morning with the gifts arrayed and the twinkling lights on. Well, that tree is the tree that the Amanita muscaria forms its symbiotic relationship to. It's always spruce or pine that it has a mycorrhizal relationship to. So the number of motifs relating Santa Claus to a cult of Amanita muscaria, there's almost nothing but relational motifs there. And yet if you suggest this to people, they just back away in horror, you know. (laughs) It's too bad McKenna died a few years back or I would have tried to talk to him about it. Although maybe if I take enough ayahuasca, I still can. But even though you'll find a lot of talk about this theory from folk like him and on drug forums or New Age spirituality sites, it's not as far-fetched as you might think. I mean, we all know that the way we celebrate Christmas isn't just a Christian invention. It's a mix of traditions that go back to old European solstice celebrations, Roman pagan rituals, and all manner of regional folklore that changes based on where you live. And tracing the history of the connection between modern Christmas celebrations and pre-Christian traditions, including ancient shamanism, is something that scholars have been working on for years. So I called a couple, see how strong that connection might really be. So when you 
you see the image of Santa, I mean, you've got to go in a in a hundred different directions at the same time in order to try and understand it. That's John Rush, professor of anthropology at Sierra College, who's written a ton on the folklore history of religion and occult practices. And his recent books include The Mushroom in Christian Art and Entheogens, or Hallucinogens, in the Development of Culture. So he's a good guy to ask. He told me that the image of Santa as a magical figure wearing a big woolly suit of red fur is something that goes back farther than you might think. And the possibility that it might mean that Santa gets a lot of his look from ancient shamans has some weight. What we're dealing here with, certainly is with shamanism. And uh, we can see the, the aspect of shamanism and the wearing of those clothes. We can take that right to, back to about 15,000 BC in a cave in France called the Cave of the Three Brothers. And in that, we see a shaman. And there are very few images of, of people in these caves anywhere that anybody's ever found. There's a couple of them that I'm aware of. And this is one of them. And what it is, is a, a human being who uh, becomes the animal master. The original animal master was probably a bear. But the cave bear dies out, and so they're in trouble with that. And so they, through their own creativity, they come up with the human being being the animal master. And you, you see him in the cave. Uh, and he's dressed in a composite animal suit with the antlers and uh, a red deer scoot, a suit and so on. He's got a wolf's tail and uh, feline genital, genitals and, and so on and so forth. We also see a similar image, almost exactly the same. It was drawn in 1780 uh, by an artist uh, of, a, of a shaman in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Uh, wearing uh, the same kind of suit with the antlers and so on. This is Shunanus, this is Woden, this is the green man uh, in, the, in, the Celtic, uh, in, in the Celtic tradition. And so we can see where this shamanic idea has come down through and the clothing has stayed pretty, pretty much the same. Now this green man or Woden figure Rush is talking about is part of a larger tradition of the wild man or the wood man. This is a character who lived on the border between nature and human society and was often seen as being the kind of go-between for humans and supernatural realms. And that's also what a shaman's role usually is and still is in some native Siberian communities. Rush isn't the only person to make this connection, by the way. There's a fascinating book by Phyllis Seifker called Santa Claus, The Last of the Wild Men that goes into this in more detail. But the point here is that the ways that pre-Christian groups in the North pictured their shamans has a lot to do with the figures that led into the Santa Claus myth. And even once St. Nicholas became a fixture on Christmas celebrations, a lot of the particularly northern and central European characters who follow him around, like Connect Ruprecht or Belsnickel or even Krampus, had this animalistic or overly rustic and, I guess, uncivilized aura about them, like they live on the edge of society and only come into contact with regular people at special, very spiritual times of the year. And Santa Claus, who's noticeably different from the still very Christian St. Nicholas, has a lot in common with those companion figures. And they all have a lot in common with the way that these early shaman figures looked and acted. The fur coats, the magic gifts, the inside into your soul, like your niceness or your naughtiness, and the general connection to the magical side of the season. I gotta say, too, that the way all these sidekicks lead to Santa Claus might be fuel for a separate podcast, since there's a much more complicated story there. But for now, how'd all this get wrapped up into the Santa we know and love? Now, it was uh, sort of standardized, or became an icon... Oh, probably beginning in the 15th or 16th century with Father Winter, uh, who's all bundled up with a sack on his back and he's bringing toys to children. We see that in Europe. Uh, the more recent renderings of this, uh, probably the best are Thomas Nast uh, with his image of Santa. Nast, by the way, is the artist who's usually credited with giving us the earliest iconic images of Santa Claus that actually stuck, at least in America. And I've got his famous pictures from Harper's Weekly up on my site. And it's definitely a shaman. And the reason we know this is because of the holly he's wearing on his head. It's Ilax aquifolium. And the magicalness of that is if you throw it at an animal, it'll lay down and do what you tell it to do. And so it shows a shaman, uh, the, excuse me, Santa as the, the animal master, the shaman. Okay, so Santa may well look like an old shaman, but his clothes aren't the only connection. When you look at the traditions associated with the practicing Siberian shaman today, things get a little weirder. Um, the, the story is that we have shaman who during the solstice, and this is the connection of Jesus and the, the new sun and so on and so forth, uh, going around in the fall and collecting uh, these Anamita muscaria mushrooms and then distributing them on the solstice. Uh, and 
of course, this business of the chimney. Uh, the chimney is an interesting symbol here. We can get to that later. But at any rate, uh, during the winter months, you can't get into the house. And so they all had trap doors in the roofs, you know, because there was just so much snow around. And so that's kind of Santa coming into the house. Uh, the pine tree is uh, brought into the house so that you could get the gift under the tree. And what's the gift under the tree? Well, it's the Anamita muscaria mushroom because it grows synergistically off of the roots of pine trees and cedar trees and so on and so forth. I have to admit I love the idea that the shaman had to enter the houses or perhaps yurts through a hole in the roof because the houses were buried in the snow and that hole was where the smoke from the fires went through, like a chimney. As a kid, I never got why Santa had to come down through the chimney. Though as a parent, I know that Santa would much rather leave things by the warm fire than have to go leave something outside on the snowy doorstep. So some reports had the shaman having to leave the mushrooms to dry on the leaves of the trees, which looks suspiciously like Christmas tree ornaments. I don't know if I buy that part, but it doesn't stop plenty of people from trying to say that this is why we decorate Christmas trees. Some even say that they had to be dried further by being hung near a fire once they got delivered, like a stocking. So if that wasn't enough, there's also the reindeer. See, apparently Siberian reindeer love, and I mean love, to eat the mushrooms. But the animals are also a significant part of Siberian culture, because they're essentially the most common beasts of burden. Carl Ruck, professor of classics at Boston University, points out that they make this whole connection even stronger. And I apologize for the background noise here. First of all, uh, it's uh, extremely un uh, unusual to have reindeer fly. Uh, and uh, and the, the reindeer uh, uh, are the only deer that can be hitched up to a cart. Uh, and they are native to Siberia. And so, and, and uh, as early as the uh, 17th century, it was documented that the uh, uh, Siberian shamans were using Amanita muscaria. The wasn't attracted back to them. And the association with the deer is that uh, the deer are very, very fond of eating Amanita muscaria. Oh, and the whole reindeer thing gets a little untasty. People have actually seen the uh, the uh, uh, reindeer going out and digging for these mushrooms and actually uh, seeking out urine from other reindeers that have consumed the mushroom because uh, what you get out of the urine is the mucimol, it's the pure mucimol, and you don't have the bad effects of it. Okay, so obviously everyone who still sends cards with the mushrooms on them or hangs a mushroom ornament on a tree doesn't go tripping every Christmas morning. I mean, images and traditions often get kept for reasons we don't even remember, and it could have been that all these connections were misunderstood leftovers. But I like to think that the images had to stay around for a reason and really represent something still meaningful. And Rush said something that kind of clicked for me. Well, yeah, I, I think that some of the meaning has been lost to it, but I think that they referenced luck. <laughs> In other words, the lucky mushroom and uh, the lucky broom used to uh, sweep out chimneys and chimney chimneys representing uh in some way, because it's an open fire in a house, it, the house is a pipe, <laughs> and you're you're you know you're smoking it really. And anyways, you want you need to keep that uh, chimney clean so that the smoke could go up to the gods, or the messages could go up to the gods, and so on. And so you're you're talking around this whole business of luck. And if you have a mushroom like that, or or a chimney sweeps broom, or even a chimney the image of a chimney sweep, these are kind of lucky images throughout Europe. And keep in mind that they, this, that whole area of the geography would be certainly closer to all of this. When he mentions chimney brooms, by the way, he's talking about those bundles of switches that Krampus and Connect Ruprecht carry and supposedly hit the naughty kids with. But these symbols can often get all mixed up. The point about magic luck and wanting to keep some kind of access to the supernatural world, well, when you get away from the Christian or the seasonal meanings of the celebration... Christmas is the one time of the year when even cynical fools like me feel like the world gets a bit more magical. So that, that's why I think they're so pervasive here, and we see the iconography. I think the, the, a lot of the meaning has been lost, and you're just, for some people, just looking at pretty, pretty plants. Sure. Uh, but the deeper meaning is that these have been used to commune with the other side, to either 
solve problems or for a spiritual adventure or from sort of indoctrination and so on and so forth. That's the thing that makes me like this theory in the end. I mean, the mushrooms are definitely still around in decorations, so be sure to check your friend's tree next time you're at their house. You never know what you'll find. And keep your eyes out for them at stores. I guarantee you'll see them more than you'd expect. So that direct connection is still there. As for Santa being a shaman, there's enough support for the idea that the way he looks and acts is part of a long tradition that at the very least mixes his character with other characters who are definitely drawn from the same cloth. And yeah, of course, Saint Nick got mixed in along the way, but some of these connections go back far further than the saint. And come on, who doesn't love this explanation for reindeer flying seriously, seriously high? But I personally like this idea for what I guess is a spiritual reason. And if you can't tell from the way I usually talk about people's cherished traditions and icons, I'm not a particularly spiritual person. My whole shtick is basically being cynical about stuff that other people take really seriously. And I get angry little notes all the time about how much I must hate Christmas or hate the season, but that's not it at all. I actually love Christmas. But I have a pretty high bar for stuff I'm going to take seriously, because I need it to cut through a lot of the crap that's too sentimental or dogmatic or pandering or whatever. But I love Christmas because it's the one time of the year when I let my cynical self believe that something magical might break through all the schlock and awfulness that's out there. I mean, I love a good dose of Christmas. I love how the world changes. The colors get brighter, people let down their guard a bit, and the rules don't seem quite so strict, and I just generally get the sense that there's way more going on than I can possibly imagine. And I get the sense that those old shaman went after the mushrooms for a bit of the same thing. Their trip gave them a dose of the world that was more meaningful, taught them better how to deal with the day-to-day, -day, and maybe just generally reminded them that magic might break in at any time if you let yourself be open to it. They certainly thought bringing the magic to other people as a little gift was making their world better. That's what Santa does too. So there it is, people. Santa's a magic fungus. Yes, I believe it with all my heart and soul, whatever that is. Look, if you want to get into this a bit more, I'll post links to some of the better books and the best sites I can find at weirdchristmas.com. I'll also put the full interviews with Dr. Rush and Dr. Ruck up too, and they both had a whole lot to say about the relationship between drugs and other holidays and religion in general that just didn't work for this podcast, but they were fascinating conversations. Thanks again for listening. If you think I'm insane or high for talking about this stuff, let me know at weirdxmas at gmail.com or leave a comment on the website. And don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Leaving a review also just gives me the jollies, and I'd appreciate any feedback. Find me on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and Instagram, and all the usual stuff is at weirdchristmas.com. And a special thank you to Brian Earl and his truly beautiful Christmas Past podcast. Brian gave me a shout-out and even played a little spot I made last week, and he's been incredibly helpful and supported me ever since I started blabbing into a microphone last year. So thanks, Brian, and definitely go check him out. You know, he plays it cool, but deep down, I know he likes it when Christmas traditions have funky backstories. The next episode will be a special treat that I got a lot of help with, and I'll leave you with a little preview of what you'll have to suffer. So until next time, here's hoping Santa doesn't stuff you in his bulging, sweaty sack. Sweaty sack.